thanks everybody for uh, for attending this talk today. It's a real privilege to um, try and translate a bit of what we see uh, behind our computers into uh, potentially policy and practice. And um, also just, uh, it's always a privilege to, to get to speak and, and share knowledge um, with a, an audience like yourselves. Um, I'd like to thank Tim and, and um, Kate Valance, who's in the back there, for organizing this. Um, and really everybody involved, because it takes a lot of people to, um, uh, to put these things together. Um, so what I'm going to uh, be presenting today is just a, a bit on the barriers to accessing uh, treatment specifically for methamphetamine. Um, however, in our experience, treatment practices don't really differ that much between uh, the treatment for methamphetamine and the treatment for amphetamine. Um, so just a little disclaimer that this will kind of overlap and I'll use some terms uh, interchangeably. Um, but really our focus is on the kind of more potent uh, spectrum of the amphetamine drug class. Um, and before I start, I'd just like to thank my co-authors there on the bottom, uh, Craig Cumming and Lakina, um, Aaron Kelty and David Preen. Without them, this, this research uh, would not be possible. And they're terrific. Uh, so I structured it a bit like a, a general paper, um, because it is a paper. Uh, so I'm going to go through a little background. I'm going to go take a little side tour into a bit of the trends that, it, that we're noticing in this part of the world. I'm also going to um, take a kind of a case study point of view from Australia. Um, then I'm going to explain the aims, the methodology, results, and conclusions of, of the systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, so just a bit of background and definition. So methamphetamine is a central nervous system stimulant. Uh, to our knowledge, it was first synthesized in 1919. Um, and large-scale illicit production likely originated somewhere in the 1960s. Um, crystalline methamphetamine was, um, is basically a derivative of this. Uh, the chemical composition is D-methamphetamine hydrochloride. Um, and it was basically developed in, in the 1980s. Um, some of the pertinent think characteristics of it is relatively low cost as drugs go. Um, it's more amenable to smoking and, and, and snorting essentially um, than typical methamphetamine and uh, it has increased potency and we've noticed that there's the evidence says there's greater dependence liability. Um, most of our evidence in this area comes from Western nations, um, so keep that in mind as I go through a lot of these slides. Um, we don't know much about other parts of the world other than potentially drug seizures. Um, and uh, what we do know is that dependent methamphetamine use is associated with a range of deleterious health outcomes. Um, and you can see by the list, you know, go, go down the list, psychosis, depression, cognitive impairment, a non-fatal overdose, suicide, um, other premature preventable mortality, uh, also violence, incarceration, the criminal justice system. Uh, and that's not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, but, um, you know, you get the point. It's, it's uh, associated with a range of problematic things. Uh, so recent gr global estimates place the uh, number of individuals using amphetamine type stimulants between 13.9 and 54 million um, yields a best estimate of about 34 million individuals. Uh, and just for a note, that's greater than opioid users at 32 million and cocaine users at 17 million. Um, so if we look at global detections or seizures of drugs, um, methamphetamine seizures have increased by 158% in five years, uh, su suggests a substantial increase in the manufacture and supply of methamphetamine globally. And um, key experts in the area state that it's often uh, a reliable proxy for the size of the drug market. So I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we go through the next few slides. Uh, so what do we see? Um, on, the, on the left graph there, that's uh, main indicators of drug supply and drug supply reduction. 
And if you can see, there's a line there um, that increases quite dramatically over time. Um, and that's, that line is the quantities of amphetamine types uh, stimulants seized um, over a period of, um, I think it's eight years there. Um, nine years, sorry. And the total seizures of amphetamine types stimulants reported worldwide, if you can see the other graph on the right there, uh, basically, the blue there is the proportion uh, of those seizures that are methamphetamine. So it's by far the, the most uh, seized drug uh, in the amphetamine type stimulant class. Um, and then local data, um, you can see in 2009 a similar pattern in the most of Canada. So we got British Columbia on the left side of the graph, um, Alberta, and then out to Ontario and Quebec. Quebec's a little bit of an outlier there. Um, so we see the news stories, you know, we've got lots of amphetamine type stimulant detection going on, so we've got big meth busts and um, headlines, and I just pose it to you, you know, is it, is, it a, is it a good news story? Or on the right side there, is it an early indicator of growing demand and ATS uh, related harm? So I'm going to go into a bit of a case study right now in Australia because that's where I work and live. Um, the rate of use and harms has been increasing, uh, of methamphetamine has been increasing uh, since uh, 2002. That's what the evidence shows us. Um, and this lies in the context of a sustained heroin shortage since 2000. Now, I'm not drawing any causal conclusions there, it's just for context. Um, and the prevalence of crystalline methamphetamine use by injecting has been increasing since 2009 rapidly. Um, the prevalence of methamphetamine use in Australia um, is at an all-time high, with estimates at about 2% of the population using at least monthly. Um, however, you know, what patterns do we see from the different data sources available? So it's important to to try and contextualize this information. So here we've got border seizures and clan lab busts, clandestine laboratories where the, the manufacturer is done. Um, on the left, you see the border detections, and it's quite striking if you see the trend line there. Um, in the last few years, we've got a rapid increase. Um, it, 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 it remains to be bore out if that continues, but in, at least in the last few years, there's been increased detections. Um, similarly, in the clandestine labs uh, detections, you also see a rapid increase in the last few years. Again, is this a good news story, or is it a sign of increasing demand and supply? Um, then we look at the uh, New South Wales mental health units for amphetamine use disorders and psychosis. So you've got um, contacts with these units in black there for um, abuse or, or misuse uh, related contacts and then in the lighter line, I know it's hard to see up there, but in that lighter line you've got psychosis related contacts. And so you can see there's a, a well-known peak that happens in the mid 2000s and then kind of a decrease around the um, 2010 and then you've got this quite severe increasing trend after that. So again that looks very similar to that. Um, here's calls to, to ADIS which is a helpline service, a crisis line service about meth methamphetamine specifically and you can see again, and especially for crystal methamphetamine, a similar trend. So you've got, this is an indication of harms in the community. Um, and there's been a, a rather striking increase recently. Um, and then you go to the hospitals, so hospital separations for um, amphetamine specific contacts. Um, again, you have a very similar um, uh, trend there. You see that peak in the mid 2000s, then the dip, 2010, and then a quite a striking increasing trend. So, what about North, North America? Um, strikingly similar. Uh, in the US, the overall reported prevalence has dropped from a peak in the mid 2000s. Uh, however, in the latest data that at least I had access to, um, you see, you know, 2009. 
uh, kind of a, a small increasing trend there. Um, I don't have the most recent data from this group, so it'd be interesting to see if we're seeing the same patterns there as I, I presented from Australia. Um, but the, in, in 2009, the lifetime prevalence uh, of methamphetamine use was estimated at 5.8% for males and 4% for females, and these are very similar trends as observed in Canada. So again, we we'll go to the CLAM lab uh, uh, trends, and this is in, uh, in the U.S. Um, you see that peak in the mid-2000s decrease, and then um, the prevalence of all items identified as methamphetamine is, is again increasing, and so are the lab incidents. I think one of the most troublesome trends potentially is this. Um, so what you have in red here is the mean purity of all detections um, and seizures. Uh, what you have is rapidly increasing purity, and the PPG mean is price per gram pure. So you have the price decreasing and the purity increasing. Um, and from most of the research that we uh, know, that's uh, indicative of uh, potential for harms there. One of the other interesting things is that if you look at the national rate in uh, the U.S., it tells one story, and that's at the bottom there. So you see around 5 to 6 percent, 7 percent, and then a bit of a dip back towards uh, 5 percent in 2008. Uh, however, there's substantial spatial variability in these um, prevalence trends. Uh, so you look at Hawaii, basically anywhere in the west to midwest, and you have substantial elevated use um, compared to the national trend. So we need to actually dig into the data a little further in order to get the full picture. Um, so what, what do we know about Canadian estimates? Well, um, probably the most recent prevalence, prevalence estimate, or at least robust one, um, was done uh, out in uh, Ottawa. And basically the authors did a triangulation of several data sources. Now when I dug further, they basically uh, looked at two primary data sources. So one they called multiplier methods, um, which is basically a combination of wastewater analysis and overdose data. And then they combine that uh, with synthetic estimation methods, is what they called it. Uh, basically, it's using multiple survey re results and um, combining it in a fairly technical way. Um, so they estimate the, the total number of meth users in Canada. Uh, if So what you have here is 0, 20, and 50%. Basically, they those are how much um, under-reporting they hypothesize. So if you think that basically the detections are bang on, then you would say, okay, look at the 0%. I would suggest that there's probably some under-reporting there, so whether you believe 20 to 50%. Best estimate would probably lie somewhere between 62,000 to 78,000 current methamphetamine users. Um, that's what the evidence says at this point. I'd probably say under-reporting rules the day there, but we'll stick to the evidence. Um, recent trends in Vancouver, well, uh, one of the most recent, and I think this is from Evan Woods and MJ Malloy's group over in Vancouver, um, looking at uh, the proportion of recent drug use by substance, um, and so they've got crystal meth there at the same proportion of heroin, second next to marijuana. Again, looking at recent trends in Vancouver, uh, these are drug injection events at Insight, which is the um, supervised injection site in Vancouver, for anyone who doesn't know. Um, the number of methamphetamine inject injecting events has um, been increasing for five years. Um, it's now... Uh, estimated higher than cocaine injections there, um, and heroin's kind of slowly creeping up as well. Um, another thing to look at is the epidemiology of methamphetamine harm onset. So 
Um, what we see in methamphetamine is there's an early onset of methamphetamine related harms in our young people. You can see, you know, 16, 18 uh, years old, um, you have uh, clients reporting, you know, methamphetamine problems at admission um, uh, to health services and then, uh, or addiction services, and then 19 to 24 it peaks. Um, so that's quite an early onset of methamphetamine related harm. Uh, and that's another uh, kind of problematic trend. And the other, you may not be able to see this that well, it wasn't really that well presented in the publication I took it from, um, but it basically shows uh, youth uh, residential substance abuse treatment admissions uh, for methamphetamine as the primary uh, drug of concern. Um, and as you can see, again, it's weighted heavily. Uh, the darker circles there are more proportion of the services um, admissions, and you can see it's weighted heavily to the west coast again. Um, and here's a closer up view. So um, you've got Vancouver Island there, and uh, the lower mainland is the primary um, least uh, prevalence of youth admissions for the primary drug of concern. Um, this, this is a trend uh, which I think is a bit concerning. So you've got two lines here. One is um, people who reported crystal methamphetamine injecting initiation at baseline. Um, and then you've got the comparison group which didn't report any injected, injecting of uh, crystal methamphetamine. What this shows you is the time, the cumulative hazard of injecting initiation over time. So those who are using uh, crystal methamphetamine um, had a shorter time to injection. And this is all based in youth um, in Vancouver. Uh, so basically over a five year period, um, you had about 30% um, of those who were using crystal meth started injecting over a five year period um, compared to uh, looks about 13% of the comparison group. Um, again, onset of harm. So um, basically individuals who uh, said they were injecting at baseline over a 12 month period, how many of them injecting daily went to an ER? Well, that's the top, the black line there. And you see it's almost at 70%. So you got 70% of um, street involved youth accessing an emergency uh, department compared to if they're not using daily, uh, you know, it's 30%. So these are some concerning trends. Um, this was very interesting to me. So this is a paper uh, published in 2012. Um, and this person in our, this, this group in Ontario went around and asked the um, clinicians at treatment services, so alcohol and other drug treatment services, um, whether they, how they perceived methamphetamine in their as a problem in their client population. Um, and as you can see, only 9% reported it as a significant problem. Um, and combining a uh, significant and moderate problem, you're still only about you know 28%. Um, and 55% said so it was only a minor problem. So. I'll let you draw your own conclusions about that. Um, so now I'll get into just some background. So we know that the evidence says that treatment for methamphetamine use disorders is effective in uh, the reduction and cessation of use. Um, treatment vastly outweighs the costs of implementing it when uh, improvements in health, social justice, and related economic costs are considered. Um, but the problem with treatment is it only has the potential to work for those who gain access to it. Um, so you can't give treatment if the person isn't in your treatment facility or hasn't contacted you. Um, so we do know as well that there's substantial complexities around treating methamphetamine related substance use disorders. Um, and the concerning trends of increased supply, purity and harms that I've presented before um, we would assert that this places increased importance on the engagement with effective treatment for these disorders. Um, so prior, prior research on barriers um, in accessing substance use treatment in general, so just in the general scale, have come up with 
a list, and this again isn't exhaustive, but these are just some of the things that you know drug users um, face when they you know or describe as barriers when they try and access these treatment or services. Um, you know, waiting lists, treatment not suited to my needs or my children's you know um, consideration or my partner's consideration. Uh, not satisfying entry criteria, so they feel like they get filtered into things that aren't appropriate appropriate for them. S substantial stigma, costs, bad reputation amongst their peers, etc. Um, job loss. Um, however, we have less understanding of the substance-specific barrier profile. So, is this just a general thing that's kind of ge generalizable to anyone who uses substances, or is this substance-specific? We have less information there. Um, there's been an, almost a decade of calls for improvements in alcohol and other drug services in treating meth methamphetamine use. However, litter is, little is known about the potential barriers experienced by those who currently use methamphetamine and want treatment. Uh, and to our knowledge, there's been no prior systematic review of these potential barriers to treatment. So our aims were to uh, firstly, identify uh, the most commonly reported barriers to accessing methamphetamine treatment in the peer-reviewed literature, examine the potential for publication bias in the literature included, and if you don't know what that means, I'll go into it a bit later, and uh, provide some recommendations that may inform government and non-government agencies in planning new services and adapting uh, existing services. So lofty aims, we'll see how we do. Um, so the information sources are there. Uh, we basically used the five most prominent search engines uh, and then added in Google Scholar as a secondary source as it has been documented to improve the robustness of this process, um, particularly using the cited by link. So you spider out, um, I'm sure most of the people are web savvy in here. Um, but that's how we did it. Um, and we, we searched from basically their inception uh, to the um, uh, 31st of March this year. Uh, the search strategy, so each database was independently searched by two of the authors on this paper, uh, not myself, uh, full disclosure. And uh, search terms were as follows. So we looked at barriers and, and analogs of barriers, um, access, and then um, amphetamine and, and aliases there, and then uh, treatment or support. Um, and these were all sourced through available literature uh, in, in, in the peer-reviewed sphere. Um, so our inclusion criteria was um, original research studies, so those were qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods, um, and they had to be published in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, Though we only restricted it to studies, though, those investigating the barriers to accessing services that provide treatment. Um, so we wanted to focus on just the barriers there. Um, and they had to be written in English. So this excluded a bunch of review articles, uh, technical reports, working papers, conference proceedings, and other gray literature. Um, so in line with the PRISMA methodology, and anybody who's done a systematic review will know what that is, but it's basically a guideline of best practice when you're doing this. Um, so you extract authors, data publication, setting, population, sample information, um, and et cetera there. Um, and then your targeted interests, so that would be um, identified barriers to accessing that treatment. Uh, so data synthesis and analysis, so we took uh, reported barriers to accessing methamphetamine treatment and recorded them for each study. Uh, we conducted uh, content analysis uh, to examine the frequency which uh, individual barriers were reported across these studies, and then we used thematic analysis, which if there's any qualitative researchers in the group um, will know it's basically identifying themes from consensus in the, um, in the data and we did that across all those studies as well. Uh, we did a meta-analysis, which is basically you pool the proportion of respondents who endorsed various barriers. So you have information on individuals on the individual level, and you basically pool that prevalence across all the studies. Um, we included studies if they reported either a count or a proportion, 
um, and that was of the participants who identified a particular barrier. Uh, and an overall proportion for each reported barrier was calculated using a random effects model. I'm not going to go into random effects modeling here in detail. Um, however, if anybody has any questions about it, they can, they can either ask a question during question time or seek me after. Let's get to the exciting stuff, the results. All right. Um, so 29 relevant studies were initially identified um, after a whole process, and I'll show you the, the PRISMA diagram after this. Uh, after inclusion criteria was applied, we identified 11 studies that were included. Um, and then the countries, it was across five countries, so again, you see the Western nation bias there, um, possibly with the exception of China and South Africa, depending on where you draw the cutoff these days. Um, so here's the PRISMA diagram. I don't know if you can see that very well, but you know, up, up at the second, one, two, third, Classification. So after we removed duplicates, et cetera, um, we had about 884 articles to go through. Uh, so anybody who does this work knows that it's extremely arduous. Um, and uh, Craig and Lakina uh, did a wonderful job in uh, kind of doing the grunt work there. Anyways, you whittle it down and whittle it down. Then we had the 29 articles. Then we applied the um, uh, inclusion criteria, then we got down to 11. Uh, so really not a great amount of research in the area. Um, the study design of the articles, you know, seven were cross-sectional, um, three were longitudinal, so they followed people up over time, uh, and one was cro basically cross-sectional with a qualitative follow-up, so it was a mixed <laughs> method study. Um, primary data generated was quantitative, qualitative, and two were mixed methods, meaning both. Uh, so most involved uh, participants who were either uh, current amphetamine users uh, or uh, a combination of current and former users. Uh, one study did collect data from service providers exclusively. Um, so pro, uh, in terms of the thematic analysis, four primary categories of barriers were uh, identified. And those were as follows, psychosocial or internal barriers. Um, practical barriers, suitability of services was another theme, and uh, service provider barriers. Um, and I'll go into those in detail here. Uh, so when you do this process, you come up with these lovely tables to kind of condense information, and so that's what you see here. So you got the four themes that we identified, and then you've got all the articles going uh, on the columns there, and then the little dots represent whether they reported the barrier in the in the left-hand column or not, and then we've got a total number there. But I will explain it to you in more detail. Uh, so as far as psychosocial barriers, we um, <coughs> had some prominent ones, so belief that um, their methamphetamine use was not problematic or no desire to stop enjoyment of use was a barrier, you know, kind of preempting their access to treatment. Um, stigma and or, and or embarrassment. Oh, and by the way, I've got the number of studies over in the right, you know, after each um, dot point there. So that's the number of studies that reported this particular barrier. Confidentiali uh, confidentiality and privacy concerns was reported. Implications of seeking treatment on child custody arrangements. That was reported as well. Um, and concern that meeting other substance users at treatment facilities may trigger them to use again. And most of those have been represented in some type of form in uh, barrier research previously. Um, as far as practical barriers, so we got um, very typical ones here, so cost, lack of availability of spaces, uh, waiting list times, inability of services to accommodate women, I thought that was very interesting, um, and competing responsibilities in caring for children. Uh, suitability of services, again, I found some very interesting ones here. Um, service not specifically relevant or effective for methamphetamine. So that shows there is some sensitivity and specificity involved here. Uh, reluctance to attend services that also treated heroin users, uh, potential to be classified as having a mental illness by some services, and that kind of overlap with the fear of stigma, um, psychosocial barrier. 
Um, in terms of service provider barriers, the main ones, negative attitudes of service providers as barriers, so negative experiences. Um, a lack of confidence in current treatment options, so whether they were going to be effective for the person. Absence of a pharmacological treatment for methamphetamine, so there is some um, kind of acute measures, but there's no kind of comparable uh, treatment option in terms of pharm pharmacology to those available for opioid dependence. So there's no real comparable uh, treatment protocol there. Um, comorbid mental illness is a complicating factor um, and not returning calls. So they'd phone the treatment and they wouldn't return their calls. Um, as far as the meta-analysis goes, so this is a forest plot. Um, basically on the right hand you see all those dots and there should be lines there I don't know if you can see it but on the right there um, the further right you go the higher the pooled prevalence is of that item okay so really there's kind of four ones that are above 50 percent there and I'll go into those in detail but um, only six of the studies reported counts or proportions and then and thus were included in the meta-analysis um, however, the pooled proportion of individuals, all of them were well over 100 and some up around 1,000. So we had pretty good information uh, and pretty good statistical power there. So the four most commonly endorsed barriers were all psychosocial in nature. Um, so you got embarrassment or stigma, 60%. Belief that treatment was not needed, 59 Self-reliance and a, a desire to withdraw on their own was 55, and privacy and confidentiality concerns were above 50 percent. So that's a substantial proportion of these individuals reporting barriers. In contrast, practical barriers were reported in significantly lower proportions, so not many people found limited availability of services. I guess one in five, that's still substantial, but um, long waiting lists, again, about one in five, and cost was only reported by 12% as a barrier. Okay, the funnel plots. So the funnel plots are an interesting thing. It assesses publication bias, and what it means is that if you have a smaller sample size, you're going to have more variability by nature, um, and the larger sample size, you have less variability. So that's why they call it a funnel. You plot the variability on this plot and if the smaller sample size by sample size and if the smaller sample size ones have more variability thus have a wider base and the larger ones come converge uh, then basically you have what's called a funnel and it's an indication that there's no publication bias or no observable publication bias. Um, if people who have non-significant findings in lower sample sizes don't publish you're going to get a wobbly kind of funnel you're going to have gaps in the bottom there. That's what it basically assesses. Anyways, we didn't see any publication bias or evidence of publication bias in this study. So discussion, um, what can we kind of learn from these findings? Um, so we would suggest that our findings indicate that there are relatively few studies investigating barriers to methamphetamine treatment. Only 11 studies met our inclusion criteria, and only nine studies had quantified uh, the prevalence of specific barriers in any way, shape, or form, and only six had a counter proportion. Uh, interestingly, I think while, while most policy change often focuses on logistical and or practical barriers, um, and obviously these are important to alleviate, uh, however, our meta-analysis indicated that the most commonly reported barriers uh, were psychosocial in nature, um, and they are there. I've already described those to you. So what can we learn about these things? So one of the things we know about stigma in uh, marginalized populations is that it can be attributed to extremely poor health, so the fear of judgment around their poor health or poor lifestyle. <coughs> Um, also related social, social issues with methamphetamine, such as violence, criminal justice system involvement, etc. Um, and interestingly, um, one of the things that came out in, in our research is uh, media campaigns. So 
A lot of the media campaigns in the last 10 years have utilized shock or fear with the aim of changing behaviors. So really confronting images, um, you know, really hard line messages around the criminal justice system, destroying family, etc. Uh, so sensationalizing the issue of methamphetamine use um, in, a, in a way likely to stigmatize. And prior literature has suggested that these campaigns must also emphasize the treatment options available in order to be effective. So you can't just shock and then not offer an, uh, an alternative. Um, and, and currently, um, it's not a total across the sphere, but generally we don't do that. Um, so we would suggest that psychosocial approaches addressing, addressing shame and stigma um, have increased treatment attendance for methamphetamine use in the past, and it's probably a good thing to look at in this area given the results here. Um, so how do we address not requiring treatment? Well, prior research has observed a positive association between the inclination to seek treatment and two things in methamphetamine use. That's the level of methamphetamine uh, dependence, so there's a positive association. So basically, as your level of dependence goes, uh, raises, you have more inclination to seek treatment. Okay? We also know that risky health behaviors such as injecting drug use. When you transition to more risky health behaviors in terms of your methamphetamine use, you are more inclined to seek treatment. The problem there is that then, you know, if we rely on that naturally, we're only accessing treatment um, at the most uh, severe end of the methamphetamine spectrum. So at the time of access, harm is likely already substantial, and I'm sure people have seen that in their own clinical practice. Um, that's one of the reasons we see a lot of methamphetamine-related ER presentations, because it's immediate and it's acute, and the harms are so substantial that they need immediate care. Uh, so preventive and early intervention strategies uh, to engage methamphetamine users in treatment early is warranted. Um, and in our research, we would suggest that psychosocial therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy and CBT may, may be really important, important for you know, implications around treatment seeking, seeking early and also the retention in treatment um, when they get there. So we know there's large dropout rates in methamphetamine-related treatment, um, likely probably due to the same barriers that I put up on the board earlier, uh, and uh, we need to find a way to address that. Um, so preparing to withdraw without assistance. Um, challenges during withdrawing from methamphetamine are vast. Here's only a few things, so depression, irritability, and hedonia, problems concentrating, musculoskeletal pain, impaired social functioning, um, also being related to self-harm and suicide. Uh, and, you know, often depressants such as cannabis, benzodiazepines, and heroin are commonly used when coming down. And that's problematic because they're observed to increase the risk of overdose during that period. Um, so what are what the evidence suggests is that withdrawing without assistance could be challenging for many methamphetamine users, and strategies to alleviate that are probably warranted. Moving on to confidentiality or privacy concerns, so I think these are related a lot to criminal justice, and this is what the evidence says, a lot to criminal justice system implications, so going, you know, violating parole, being committed back into prison, uh, being found of, you know, like your criminal past, you know, there's surveillance, stuff like that. Also job loss, so concerns around be this information being transferred somehow to employers, duty of care, mental illness reporting. I mean, there's a whole range of social service interventions relating to child custody. These are all things um, that are of concern to these individuals. Uh, and this suggests a confusion around what information remains confidential and that which is reported to third parties. So we would suggest that greater education around confidentiality and mandatory reporting requirements is warranted for these individuals. We need to give them this information. We need to create a balanced discussion around this. 
Uh, so implication for service providers, uh, tailoring, tailoring interventions towards identified barriers is more likely to lead to improvements in practice. We know this from prior research. Um, and we would suggest that ta tailoring services to meet the specific needs of methamphetamine users, a la psychosocial barriers, um, is likely crucial to their success in the treatment. And strategies to address the main barriers we identified here should be considered. Specifically, uh, strategies to increase awareness of the possible methamphetamine dependence, uh, the possibility of methamphetamine dependence, and the benefits of treatment. So we need to convey that there are benefits to treatment really clearly. Um, to address and reduce the stigma associated uh, with methamphetamine use. To improve education in users and practitioners around the methamphetamine withdrawal process because there's substantial harm there. And fully inform users of the treatment options available and what they mean to be accessed. Service tailoring must be evidence informed and implemented carefully and evaluated rigorously. Um, I know it's not rocket science, but when we do something, do it carefully and then evaluate it rigorously to see that it's having the impact that you hypothesized in the first place. Um, the task will be complicated by the fact that many methamphetamine users are also polysubstance users. Therefore, service design for some users will require careful consideration. Uh, rigorous evaluation of service effectiveness for methamphetamine dependent polysubstance users is warranted because there's very li little information in that area currently. Uh, just a few policy implications. I mean, to improve service delivery, we should acknowledge that um, methamphetamine use is often accompanied by mental health problems. And really, we would suggest that the evidence uh, um, indicates integrated treatment um, has been established as more effective compared to parallel services. So addressing substance use disorder and mental illness in the same location at the same time is more effective than trying to address one and then sending someone over to another service and trying to address the other. And there's a range of, of reasons for that, but um, that's what the evidence says. So we would suggest that greater integration between alcohol and drug and mental health services is urgently needed. Uh, so just some conclusions briefly. There is a growing need for appropriately, uh, appropriately designed services to treat methamphetamine dependence. The main barriers to accessing these services are psychosocial in nature. Um, and we would suggest that com consumer-informed strategies to alleviate the psych psychosocial barriers um, identified in our study here are urgently needed to reduce the harm due to dependence in the community. There's also a need for more research on effective treatments for polysubstance use involving methamphetamine, improved integration and collaboration between uh, alcohol and drug and mental health services is essential for achieving better treatment outcomes in this group, and uh, again, uh, further research into methamphetamine withdrawal and potential <laughs> pharmacotherapy regimens is warranted a few re recommendations. Now, we saw a bunch of trends earlier, um, and I'd have to say in my experience, and, and um, Australia is really good at their surveillance and monitoring in this area. Um, they do a very good job at a national level, um, and they, they do a good job of what's called data triangulation. Um, and so I would suggest that we need to do our best to up our surveillance and monitoring capacity. Um, it's a way to see early trends before they get to what's called an epidemic, often in the media. Um, and I think some keys here, so there's the acute or upstream health services. So this is what the pointy end of the service is. Um, so we need effective and linked monitoring between ambulance attendances, because remember a lot of people refuse transport at an ambulance attendance. It's an opportunity for early intervention. Um, then you've got the Cascade ED presentations. Um, people can walk out of the ED as well, so you need to monitor that. And then you've got hospitalizations, 
which is likely the most severe end of the spectrum. You need the whole thing, and you need to be able to link and follow people through that um, cascade to see how they're doing, to see if they're then going on to what is the downstream services, such as alcohol and drug and mental health services. And a key component, which they do very well in Australia, is calls to crisis helplines. Again, that, that kind of is not subject to some of the barriers identified. It can be anonymous. So you're just getting data from people there. Um, and likely a substantial proportion of those individuals never go on to actually contact the upstream services or the downstream services. And then self-report surveys. So that's where you're going to pick up the, the traditional non-help seekers and probably a lot of the marginalized individuals. Yep. Um, so just consider the source. Trends based on self-report data may be subject, subject to psychosocial bias, and we know that psychosocial barriers are, are prevalent in this group. So media exposure, CG, uh, criminal justice system-related policy um, may be affecting this. We know there's so social acceptability bias at work, so can't just rely on self-report alone. Um, so just some limitations. Selection criteria. There was a small number of included studies. Um, and it made it possible that relevant gray literature was not included, so just so you, full disclosure there. Um, however, thematic saturation was reached for most themes, and uh, there was substantial heterogeneity in study design and methodology, so the comparability may be um, in question there. Uh, so some just some future research there. Uh, specifically, is there a hierarchy to these barriers? So do you have to fulfill practical barriers before you get to the psychosocial barriers? Is there any kind of hierarchy to those things. I think that's really important. Anyways, thank you very much for your time.